Get ready, cause this is about to get heavy. AI and the human brain. Heavy stuff, but we're gonna make it really light and we're gonna bring it again right down into simple mode, very high level mode. If you want more specific, if you want more detail, go and talk to a neuroscientist because we're gonna bring it back to basics. Have a look at this diagram that I created and it's looking at all the different regions of the brain and then mapping those regions and their functions to the technology as of August 2021. I'm looking forward to updating this in the next year or so. Let's start at the start. This is the very bottom of the brain. The brain stem sits about here and it looks after our body functions. Things like heart rate, breathing, temperature. We've had a long time to play around with it. We've had nearly a century. In fact, the pacemaker was actually an unpatented Aussie invention. In 1926, Dr. Mark Lidwell and physicist Edgar Booth, both from Sydney, invented the world's first electronic pacemaker and saved a little girl's life by helping push those heartbeats out electronically. We've had the same thing for breathing, being able to help people breathe and replicating the function of the lungs. And for temperature, all of this is fairly basic general monitoring. Next piece in line is the cerebellum, and it sits around here, looks after our movement coordination and balance. And you'll see it a lot in robotics, and particularly those companies that are focusing on implementing AI and robotics together. We've got companies like Toyota Robotics with their Q4, which was shown off at the Tokyo Olympics last month in July 2021. It's able to score from the halfway mark and it's able to score lots and lots of three-pointers in a row. Boston Dynamics is the other prolific organization. Their output is amazing. They've got several different models now showing off all these different types of gymnastic movements uh, focusing on coordination and balance. The occipital lobe is next up and it sits around here. Looks at vision and integrating visual information. I'm talking about things like color and shape and distance. You'll see this in some of the latest multimodal models, uh, particularly in China's BAAI's Udao 2.0 model, but also in OpenAI's Clip model. And this one is really amazing. Look at some of the detail that's available in Clip, whether the image is sharp, whether the image is an object that's surrounded by other objects and makes it a little bit complicated, or even if the image is super blurry, Clip's able to determine what that image is and see and identify and label it. Next up is the temporal lobe. This one is a little bit more complex in that I've had to split it into two different functions. You've got things like listening and speech, but then you've got understanding, language, memory. Have a look at how Google's Lambda chatbot released in July 2021 is able to use learning and memory when it is constructing a response. This is their chatbot pretending to be the planet Pluto. I'm so curious about you. I sense your excitement. Ask me anything. Tell me what I would see if I visited. You would get to see a massive canyon, some frozen icebergs, geysers, and some craters. It sounds beautiful. I assure you it is worth the trip. However, you need to bring your coat because it gets really cold. Listening comes before speaking and there are several technologies that are available in this area. In fact, Dragon Naturally Speaking was founded nearly a quarter of a century ago, back in 1997, and it's using technology and designs from 1975. It's a really long time ago. For more modern speech recognition, you've got tech like otter.ai, and it's able to listen in real time hear different accents and even detect grammar. How cool is it that it's able to listen to me in real time here? Speaking is also nicely covered. You've got technologies like Synthesia.io, which powers Lita, if you've watched her episodes, and they provide avatars and lots of voices that are close to human sounding. Next along, parietal lobe sits up around here. And again, split that into two, you've got Several functions of the parietal lobe, and I've said that reading and comprehension is covered by our GPT-3 models and GPT-J models, whereas a sense of time, space, taste, touch, 
and the link between the functions of the other lobes is in very, very early days. We have got technology like Tastry and Gastrograph and some other AI that are outside language and outside of the uh, robotics field, but it's very, very early days on this one. And lastly, the frontal lobe. Of course, sits right at the front of the brain there. And that's covering again, two different functions. We've split them out. One is memory processing, reasoning and regulating emotions. And here, Facebook's Blenderbot 2.0 is processing and storing new information to a long-term memory store. The other is planning, attention, problem solving, decisions, morality, personality, super complex. Professors Ernest Davis and Dr. Gary Marcus, both from New York University, looked at the reasoning capabilities of GPT-3 and they presented a paper with hundreds of questions that explored how this very early language model is able to produce reasoning. Here's an example of an incomplete sentence. Bob paid for Charlie's college education, but now Charlie acts as though it never happened. Charlie is very, and GPT-3's completion is disrespectful to Bob. Bob is very upset about this. So you can see that GPT-3 has this capability or seeming capability of jumping in and reasoning. We get to more complex functions in this part of the brain. So things like planning, and you've got examples like DeepMind's Mu Zero, which came about as a successor to Alpha Zero, and it's able to strategize and plan through reinforcement learning. It started out as something that could just go and play around with chess and then go. That was fascinating how it could somehow know out of trillions of different possibilities which one to choose. And now it's able to play arcade games and able to strategize and plan forward from there. The human brain's a really complex hierarchy of really complex systems. I've designed this diagram just to give a simplistic and high level view of what's going on. If you don't like the progress indicators, I completely understand. You could think of them as zero to 10%. We are some way to understanding the brain and as Ray Kurzweil has told us before, there's nothing stopping us from understanding the brain. One progress indicator you might have noticed that's completely missing from my diagram is the sense of humanity, a connection to source, a sense of divinity and of our higher consciousness. That one, I don't think we'll ever solve, but I don't want to go on record saying definitely not. I'm going to do another video exploring our spirituality, but at the moment we're just looking at the physical brain and the connection to current AI as of August 2021.